Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I, I start with a small story. Um, I played cards with a group of guys for over 10 years. And normally we are meeting all, every two or three months and never talking about our jobs or what we are doing. And um, we just played cards. And one night, one of these guys came to me and told me about an idea how to harness the stronger winds in high altitudes. Um, and he had an idea with huge zeppelins with sails on it, which can be folded and defolded. So if you, have, uh, if you are facing um, opposite wind, they can reduce their um, resistance against the wind. And I thought, oh, that sounds a little bit insane. That is bizarre. I knew that there in altitude is more wind because when I was a child, I had a kite myself and I knew exactly on the ground, where the kite was on the ground, I have to run with the kite so the kite could lift up and when the kite reached a specific altitude, it lifted up by itself because it met the wind in altitude. And as high as the kite went up, as more power I got on the tether. So I knew there is more wind in altitude. But with that Zeppelins, Zeppelins, which have to pull cars mounted on a rail system on the bottom. I said, no. A couple of weeks later, this guy showed up again and said, would you like to write me a business plan for it? I said, if you pay me. <laughs> and he did. I said, well, so I started uh, with a feasibility study together with Technical University in Berlin. And we figured out it's not a Zeppelin, but with automatically steered kites or automatically steered wings, which are going up in altitude. That would be a very, very good idea because there is more wind in the altitude, which is, more, uh, which is stronger and which is more constant. And that's how I got involved in airborne wind energy. And I would like to take the next 10 minutes to give you a short overview about airborne wind energy, about different approaches and technologies, and uh, the, what, what we are doing right now for the energy production is mainly that we are burning fossil fuels. And don't get me wrong, fossil fuels are a cornerstone of our current prosperity and for our industry. But talking in decades and centuries, the era of fossil fuels is almost over. They are limited. And what are we doing with fossil fuels? We take the fossil fuels to burn them, then we boil water, to get some steam. The steam is going on a turbine, and the turbine is turning around, and it's moving a generator. That's how we are producing electricity. And that steam, these are moving particles. There's nothing else than wind. So why do we burn this valuable resource, coal or fossil fuels, just to produce wind, which is for free outside nearly, nearly almost all over the world? We know that for, for centuries, so we are using windmills, as you know, for 400, 500 years. And now we have, might have a closer look into a common modern windmill. What do you need to build up a windmill? You need a base, you need a tower, you need a gondola with the turbine and the generator and a rotor in it, and you need the blades. It's quite a lot of material. We just heard we have to be very, very careful with all the material because materials are limited. And if you know now that the most of the power of a common windmill comes from the tip of the blades of the windmill, so 20% of the blade is responsible for more than 60% of the power of a modern windmill. So why not taking just these 20%, tether it to the ground, and that's exactly what airborne wind energy systems are doing. As you can see here, we see one of the airborne wind energy uh, uh, prototypes from uh, a US company, Makani, which was just bought last year by Google and became now a Google X company. And you see exactly, no more tower, no more gondola, and just the last 20% of the tip of the blade. And now I would like to give you an overview about the different approaches in it. We know kites for more than 4,000 years. And that picture is from the 1880s, from the 19th century, when kites were used to pull carriages. And with modern kites, today, we use them to support cargo vessels going through the Atlantic Ocean. These are no more kit toys. These are high-specific and high-engineered um, um, wind power plants. And there are 
all over the world, there are more than 50 companies and institutions working on airborne wind energy. And last year, I had the pleasure to welcome over 200 participants on an airborne wind energy, energy conference I organized in Berlin. And they are, come from more than 21 countries. So it's not a single idea of somebody to go in that altitude and to harness the stronger winds. They are working on it worldwide. And now I would like to go into different approaches and technologies. I don't know which of these technologies will go on a commercial scale in the next years. But I give you some exciting examples to give you the overview, uh, the, the advantages of the airborne wind energy technologies. First of all, what is um, what we call a fly gen, a flying generator. So you have a balloon, or you have, in that case, a ring where, uh, with helium or hydrogen, which is bringing up the turbine in altitude. Second, you can use the auto-rotation concept. Everybody who has flown a helicopter knows that. If the engine is going out, the helicopter can still fly and can be steered. That is because of the auto-rotation concept. And you can produce energy with it. Third, for example, that is the company I already mentioned, and that is the air vehicle, or, uh, uh, yeah, that's the engine itself. So you have a rigid wing, and you have four different turbines on it, and that is going up in altitude, and it's going around, uh, and it's harnessing the wind and the electricity, and then it's bringing the electricity down by a cable. And there are other approaches, which have the generator on the ground. That's what we call ground gen. And right here, you can see one of the huge advantages of a ground gen system. They are mobile, or they are portable. So you can imagine if you have, for example, an emergency case, earthquake, or like what, we ha what happened in the Philippines, um, you can drive with that uh, mobile device directly to the location where the, the electricity is needed. And this uh, uh, approach is what we call a yo-yo system. So the kite is flying out by 10 o'clock, and until it reached uh, it's the end of the tether, it is producing electricity by pulling on a generator. And if it's reached the end of the tether, you fly it down and you bring back the tether. You are losing some electricity by bringing back the, te uh, the tether. But the amount of electricity gained is much more than the, the loss of electricity um, by bringing back the tether. Here you can see another advantage. If you have no, no uh, wind at the ground, like we have in that case, the windmill is uh, uh, stopped because there's no wind, you can fly higher. Normally, the wings or the kites are propelling in an altitude between 70 to 150 meters, which is normal for a common windmill. But if the wind, for example, during the nighttime is going up to 250, 300 meters, a towered windmill can't follow the wind. The kites, the wings, they can do. You just give more tether, and then you fly in 250, 300, 350, 400 meters. We don't like to fly in these altitudes, because as more tether is going out, as more resistance you have on the tether. So that is a loss of energy. But if the wind is going up and the wind is strong in altitude, it's perfect, because you can go up with the, with, with, with the kites and the wings itself. So there are different approaches or different companies working very hard on it. Some are using soft kites, some are, uh, and, and the, the advantage of a soft kite, for example, is um, we have seen that last year when I made that conference. We, we, owned the, uh, we, we uh, get this huge airfield in the center of Berlin, the Temple of Airfield. And one company just came up with a sack, and they pulled out their kite, and then they blew it up. And within minutes, we had a 200 square meter kite on the airfield. And that kite is able to pull more than 18 tons. And that was built up, as I said, within minutes. That's nothing you can do with a, a, a common windmill. It's impossible. Other companies are using the same system, the yo-yo system, but they're using rigid wings. There are advantages for rigid wings, there are disadvantages. So as I said before, I don't know which approach and which technology would be the best, but I think these are really exciting prototypes and what you can do. Another approach is to use the kite or the wing to pull 
um, vehicles which are mounted on a rail system, and on the rail system they are converting the mechanical energy into electricity. The idea is to have a closed loop and to have 20, 24, 30 vehicles on a row on the same loop. So that was just some approaches. I wanted to give you what is going on in um, Almond Wind Energy. And um, as you can imagine, it is very interesting also for the government. So the German government, for example, asked the Fraunhofer Institute to make a potential analysis ab about these technologies. And Fraunhofer came back uh, and said, yeah, they have the potential to produce between one euro cent per kilowatt hour and four euro cent per kilowatt hour. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is for the first time that we can produce for lower cost than this the cheapest fossil fuel, which is coal. And so for the first time in history, we have the chance to substitute fossil fuels on an economically basis. By... Thank you. <laughs> Simultaneously having a, a, a power resource, which is for free. So I would like just to give you a small conclusion and to sum it up. We are talking in Airborne Wind Energy about a resource which is free, which is available nearly at any spot of the world and could be used. These are very flexible uh, um, power plants. They can be mobile, they can follow the wind, that's what I mean with flexibility. And they can produce on the spots where the demand for electricity is. That is really, I, I like something on offshore wind. It's like they are going onto places where they have more wind. But unfortunately, on the sea, there's no demand for electricity. So why are we going offshore? We, in urban wind energy, we do the same. We go on the places where we have more wind in altitude. And we can go to the places where, the, where there is a demand for electricity. And we can reduce the material used uh, for uh, fossil fuel production as well as for conventional wind production. And I myself think that is the best chance to substitute fossil fuels. And I would like to end up with that sentence, please let the fossils rest in peace. Thank you very much.